So for the ones who are missing or are going to miss, um, they can always listen to the recording. Before we start, I just wanted to just quickly show you the Blackboard page, how it looks like, and uh, how you're going to work on your classwork activity. So you will always have the similar pattern for all the respective sessions that we have from now on. So you won't have any questions with regard to that, or you won't say that I didn't understand or I didn't see it. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to show you what I mean. Um, okay. So you should all be able to see a Blackboard screen of BUT260S. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So in the folder within BUT260X, I have renamed one as Human Resource Management, which I assume Dr. Cyrus is going to upload, and then Marketing and Economics. So we for now, are going to deal with marketing for the major part of the year. So this is how the folder is. If you click on marketing, okay, let me just show you how it looks at your side as a student. So if you click on marketing, and then in marketing, you go. So this is how the Blackboard page looks like. Now there is a learning contract. And the learning contract is basically a formal letter that both the student and the lecturer has to agree upon. So I have drawn the contract. I want you all to read. And then at the bottom of it, you can just sign and take a picture, send it to me via email, take a snapshot and att attach it in an email and send it to me back. I want each and every one of you to do that for me. The second one is online chat rules without, within the learner contract folder. So that is just a folder showing um, what are the um, rules and regulations when you are online in a live session like this. The third one is Blackboard Help. So it's basically I have attached a web link. If there is any issues with regard to Blackboard, if there are any struggles that you are having um, connecting to Blackboard, or if you want to know how to upload on Blackboard, you can just click on that web link and you look for the concerned query that you have, you will find everything there. The third one is subject guide 2021. I am in the process of uh, winding up the subject guide, so I'm going to upload it um, when we come back. Uh, when you are having your session next week, you will be able to see the subject guide in the folder. The fourth one is assessment folder. As of now, we don't have any assessment. We will possibly have our first assessment next month so start preparing yourself from now on in each and every session that is being taught by any lecturer so that you'll be able to make it up to your assessments um, in the assessment folder you will have all your assessments within that folder so you don't have to look around you don't have to get lost thinking where are you going to figure out the assessment for term one or term two so everything will be within that folder and within the folder, it will be named as term one or term two. So everything is or will be found in that folder. Number five is introductory session. So the first introductory session that we had last week, I have inserted a web link of our recording link. So if you want to listen to the recording of the discussions about assessments, about content, all that we had in the first session, you can do so. If you see in general, all the folders, I have numbered them. So whenever, whoever is going to log in early or late, this is a sequential form of viewing one folder after another and to avoid any kind of messiness or, or confusion. OK. The next one is folder six, which is today's folder. It's session one and every folder that deals with a chapter for that particular day. I'm renaming, I mean, naming it in such a way so you don't find it difficult. Session one, what was the date? What is the name of the chapter? So you'll never get lost. Within that folder, you will see subfolders. Now, the subfolders look like this. I'll show you again. The subfolders will look something like this. 
there will be four different subfolders. The first one is a startup video. So every session will have a small video attached or uploaded within. Now that video will help you to listen and understand what that particular day's folder contains, what classwork activity is there, what all you are expected to know from that particular folder. So I will record the screen and I will share that video or upload that video within this folder. Again, I have numbered them to um, for your ease to access one after another. The second folder is PowerPoint and resource material. So you will have your slides in that folder. You will have any extra resource materials. It can be terms and definitions. It can be case studies. Sometimes I will just look for a video and then upload that video, but I will make sure that I only upload very short videos and that will be embedded in Google, uh, in Blackboard. You don't have to click the link and go open it in YouTube and view it. You can just click inside it and you can just view the video there itself. The third one is linked to the recording. I anyway send you emails giving you the link for the session and then after that I send you a second email the same day giving you the link for the recording. But other than that, if some of you feel you are going to miss out that email or you get it lost somewhere in your email and you don't uh, make it or don't figure it out from your email, I will still have this link to recording folder where if you click on the web link within that, so which will always be loaded after that session. So we are having our session now. So once our session is over, once the link is downloaded, I will copy it and up, down, I mean, upload it in this folder here. So you'll find that as well. Then uh, the fourth one is classwork activity. Before I go to the classwork activity, I also want to say something here with, by link to recording. What I will also do is while we are still having our live session, I will record myself in my cell phone and then I will upload those podcasts in small chunks. So if any one of you have connectivity issues or any one of you have data issues and you can't download and listen to the whole recording for whatever reason, you will still be able to have mini chunks of those podcasts which you can download and listen to while you are preparing for uh, assignment or you are uh, going through the chapter that was taught in the session. So that also I'm going to do. Now coming back to the fourth one, which is your classwork activity. Most of the time, this is how your classwork activity will look like. So if there are questions, I will insert a Google form in within Blackboard like I've done for today's session. Now this is sort of your, you said classwork or homework because every session we have, if you see on the timetable is slotted for two hours and I feel constantly teaching for two hours is just me speaking and you not doing any kind of activity after that. So every classwork will involve that particular day's activity that we have learned in the session. So all you have to do is just move your cursor and you just answer your response in the box and then at the bottom submit it. Once you submit it, I get the response and I know who all have attempted, who all have answered what. And in the next session, which is next Friday, first thing in the session, we will discuss on the class activity that we're doing and then we move on to the new chapter. If you feel I have forgotten for that particular day's session, then you must remind me that we must still go through the class activity from the previous class. Now, this is how your standard marketing economics folder is going to look like throughout the year. There might be few additions. There might be certain things which are not applicable for that chapter, so you might not find. But 90% of the time, this is the layout of the Blackboard page that you are expected to see throughout the year. I just wanted to show you the first one that I have created and this is how it's looking. So you don't ask me questions um, with regard to what and how. Before you ask, you have everything that is self understood in the form of a startup video, in the form of links and everything. And you also don't get confused or you don't look around for your friends asking them how this is done or how do I need to approach it. So it is loud and clear and you understand that. This is what is expected of you to do every session. So there will be a classwork activity every session after we finish the session. So that one hour slot that you have within my class hours, you are expected to finish your activity within that slot. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen 
and go back to our session. Um, any questions or anything that you don't understand before we start the session um, class today? I think you may continue, ma'am, because I understand on my side. Okay. Nadima? You may unmute yourself and speak. We can't hear you. I can see you unmuted, but I can't hear you. Ma'am, I just want to ask with regards to the classwork, do we then have to do the classwork within that hour um, of your session or can we always like do it afterwards, maybe after the session or we, do we just have to do it within that hour that you give us to do the classwork? Um, the idea is that, yes, that you do it within that hour so that no one, I mean, no one really complains that I couldn't do it. I didn't have time. I didn't have data. So this is part of your timetable hours and this is part of your classwork. If for whatever reason you fail to um, answer and finish it, you have the day to finish and submit it. Don't wait for the whole week and start doing it because maybe for the first week because you all are getting used to I might leave it open. But then after that, um, from next week when I give you a classwork, I'll allocate a time. So automatically the Google form will close, which will mean that even if you try answering, it won't allow you to submit. So you all are in second year and you understand how important it is to value each and every subject and the work that is being given in each and every subject and how that uh, from your past year experience, you know that you have to make sure that you do well in all the subjects. So I would expect that you do it the same moment because that will basically be what we have studied in that session for the same day. It will be fresh in your mind. So I will advise you that you do that. But like I said, if you fail to, you have that particular day to finish the work and submit it. And it's not difficult. It's not something that is out of context that you need to read a lot. You just have to apply your knowledge and understanding um, when it comes to answering the questions. OK, I see your hands still up. Is there another question? Okay, anybody who's got any other questions or anything to clarify before I start the session further? Okay, I assume everything is loud and clear. So I will start today's chapter. It's about product decisions. I hope you all can see the screen and that the font sizes are um, clear enough. I, Nadima, your hand is up again. Is there a question? OK, looks like she's having connectivity issues. OK, that's fine. OK, so moving on to today's chapter, which is product decision. So it has more to do with um thanks Xavier. um it's got to do with uh branding and it's got to do with understanding the products in detail so i have just enhanced the font size for the ones who probably are unable to see for various reasons so i'm not going to go deep down when i speak about the product because we all have done that last year um, in our marketing and economics as well of as to what is a product or what is a service and what a product can be. 
okay or what a service can be or um, who can be a product okay so anything the basic definition that we receive in exchange and obviously we pay money in return for it then within the product there are three levels of i'm sorry i mean there are five levels of the product that is your core basic expected augmented and potential product so we're going to go through each and every um, example of those different kind of products just give me a second i just need to have a sip of water um, if there is anything you want to ask me please stop me in between or else you can just type it in the chat box and once we finish with our session i can um, clarify those doubts So when we're talking about core product, so the first one, so as it sees in the figure, it starts from the core and comes out until the potential product or it further enhances or specializes. So the first one is core product. As the name says core products, it's the core features of a product. So what can be the core feature of a product? Can anyone give me an example? So you have a product, what will be its core feature? So when I'm saying core benefit of the product, what will a product have that is very core? The main reason because of which you buy a product. That will be a core benefit to a product. What according to you is a core benefit of buying a, a t-shirt? What is the core benefit of buying a t-shirt? Anyone? It's an interactive session. You can't just sit idle and I carry on speaking. You all have to even contribute to the session. What is the core benefit of buying a teacher? Why do you why do you buy it? What is the main idea behind buying it? Yes, Lugisa. Uh, okay. Good morning, ma'am. I think. The purpose of buying a shirt is to like to cover your body or to stay warm. That's the core benefit. That's how I understand Absolutely. it, ma'am. Okay. So any other example? If you buy any product, what is the core benefit of buying that product? When you buy a food item, what is the core benefit? Is obviously you quench your hunger or your thirst or you fill up your stomach because you are hungry. So to, so to quench your hunger, you buy a food item. So anything that we own in exchange for money, the main basic reason is your core benefit of that product. Anything above that is are considered as different aspects of your product, which can be a basic or expected, um, expected or augmented. OK, so that's your core benefit. So the main reason of or the most fundamental need that you have as a buyer that will satisfy you. Okay, so buying a vehicle, basically your core benefit is you don't you have your own private transport, you don't have to depend on public transport. So that is a core benefit. Then the next is basic product. So you are happy with that product that you buy, but what is the core benefit of that product? I mean the basic benefit. So you own a car and you are using, I mean you own a car which is your core benefit, but what will be the basic benefit that will assist you to drive from one point to another but other than that the other basic benefit is how you're going to drive it should have a basic steering heel, a wheel it should have um, tires it should have windows and it should have a roof other than that if you don't have these features and you're owning a car it's of no use so the basic 
or the main tangible benefit of buying a product is a basic product okay the next one is um, another example again the very common your cell phone is the basic or tangible product you can't just have a cell phone without having any features or it's not having any apps or packaging then that's no point of having the core benefit of owning a cell phone but there is no basic product in it so then having that feature makes the product basic the third one is expected product as the word or the term says expected it's basically a set of features or a set of attributes that we as buyers normally expect and agree to when we purchase that product so what do we expect if we have that car that we have bought and it has uh, been classified as a core benefit providing product as well as a basic product what do we expect it should have an ignition if you have steering wheels if you have cars and roof um, wheels and windows but it doesn't have ignition key to turn it on that is your expectation because you expect that product to have an ignition key you expect the windows or the front um, has a windscreen wiper that cleans the window so these are your expected products this is not something that you are asking for um, enhancing the product but it is expected features that you expect out of a product so that makes the product a expected product at the fourth level you have augmented product so whatever we have discussed on the top three it's not just that but it also has to meet a customer's expectations and desires but also something more than that so when you are expecting ex, uh, when you are exceeding the expectations it's basically differentiating your product from another product so i'll give you an example augmented product basically will say that why your product is something different that i will want to buy over buying another brand's similar product so a great example in this case will be you have a car car has the basic features it has the expected uh, product features as well to make it augmented you having a vw a volkswagen or you having a mercedes that becomes or that makes the product augmented something that is not just satisfying your desires and expectations but also something more than that and you are preferring to buy a mercedes over a volkswagen or you <coughs> excuse me are you preferring to buy a uh, woolies clothing over an edgars or over a pay or a pick and pay product so which means it has a competitive advantage than the other brands now what is this funny term called competitive advantage as it says competitive and it says advantage from the phrase itself it means that something that has uniqueness something that is different it can be a feature it can be a color or it can be the brand name it can be the logo anything that is of attraction to you that you feel like buying that over similar product from another brand so that makes a product augmented so the idea of having a product augmentation is to make sure that how buyers buy and consume products okay so again very important example in this case will be basically luxury branded products where people buy them to satisfy their augmented needs or to just prove themselves that they have something that is very niche then then their peers or then their family members or then anybody they own something that is competitively advantageous as well not just by the look of it but it has certain features that makes it competitive than the other brand with exactly the similar product that is your augmented product now the fifth level is your potential product so potential product would mean not just having something that is competitively advantageous but something that is future 
or something that is very futuristic or something that has an evolution. You see it evolving in future or you see that in future this particular feature if you are adding to the products it is going to increase customer satisfaction and it is going to keep the product competitively advantaged than the other brands and it is here to stay and when we say future it would mean technologically it would need mean a smart product it would mean a sustainable product so any feature or characteristic that makes the product um, be around in the market for the next few decades or years in the future that makes the product potential product so your um, example here would be having a tablet and having a cell phone were augmented products but then having a phablet if you understand what a phablet is it's a combination or a nice amalgamation of a tablet and a cell phone makes it a phablet a phone and a tablet merges together to make a phablet and it is a potential product because you get the size of the screen that you are willing for <clears throat> it's neither too big it's neither too small and you are able to watch videos which you weren't in your cell phone but you were able to in your tablet when it was too heavy to carry so it is solving your purpose and you understand this is the future for the next few years so that makes it a potential product your um, artificial intelligence virtual reality the vr your video games and the 3d and 4d platforms that different companies are offering is making those products a potential product because people see this is the future okay so these are the different levels of a product starting from the core benefit of the product to the potential benefit now before i move on any questions from anyone in the class Yes, Zippo. Um, ma'am, <clears throat> what I would like to ask is, since I'm on the augmented products, um, what if I buy um a I can't hear you. What if you buy what? can't hear you Zizipo if it's anything that you're saying um, I don't think any of us can hear you I would suggest you type your response in the chat box Zipo, because I can't hear anything Okay, I'm moving on to the next slide. Zizipo can so long type her question in the chat box. Um, now, classifying products. So, consumer products can be classified into two categories, basis of their durability and usage. So, durable and non-durable. So, on the basis of durability, there are two classifications, a product that is durable and a product that is non-durable now we studied about that last year as well can anyone say what is a durable product and what is a non-durable product Anybody? Lungisa, what is a durable and non durable product? Okay, and what is a durable product then?
I make sure durable product doesn't have anything to do with quality as such. Uh, um, durable product is something which can survive for a long period of time. And non durable products are the ones that can't be stored for a longer period of time, which is basically your food items and sometimes some of your clothing items, which can only last for a certain period of time. That is non durable, whereas durable is basically your television, your um, refrigerator, items that stay with you for years or for a longer period of time. Okay, that makes it durable. Now, on the basis of usage, there are two kinds of products, consumer and business products. So obviously, consumer products are basically the finished products that we just basically bring it to use. So your consumer products will be your staples. It can be your emergency products as well. And then business products are basically your products that you use either as a finished item or a business product can be a semi finished product that you buy and you ultimately make something out of it. So that makes it a business product. OK, so if we go further into products within consumer and business products, if you see consumer products are of four types. They are convenience products, shopping products, specialty products, and unsought products. So we're going to go through each of them one by one. Convenience product is basically something that is quite inexpensive. So it's, it's slightly a cheaper item. That's why it says convenience. So it's a cheaper item that um, you can buy quickly from anywhere. You don't have to go to a certain place to buy them. And they're usually low priced and you will see those common products across any shopping location. Now, what are those con uh, convenience products? They can be your milk. They can be soft drinks. They can be chewing gums or your small hardware items like your screws and nuts. So something that you quickly get it at your convenience. They fall into the convenience product category. Then we have our shopping products okay within convenience products are our staples are our impulse and our emergency so obviously your medications and all fall under emergency your staples are basically something that you buy routinely such as your toothpaste your food items so impulse products are something that you buy just randomly without any pre-purchase thought or you haven't thought of buying something and you are in the store and you just like it or you want to try something different and you just buy it that's called impulse buying so something that you see it and you just get your response in your brain that I want to buy it that is impulse buying okay so those form part of your convenience products um, then you have another example nice example of emergency product is also something that you purchase immediately when you have a crisis or you need it at an unexpected time. So for example, you have uh, no time to really shop around or phone different towing services and you have a breakdown of your car in the middle of the road. So you don't go around browse or sh uh, look around that who is going to give me what kind of benefit. You just basically get the quickest one that is either available on your phone or you just ask someone who you know and can just tow your car. So that is also an example of emergency product. So price at times is not particularly important in the emergency situation. You just want to get rid of the situation. So you just do whatever is quickly available. We also do emergency products at airports. You know, when we forget something, it can be a personal care product. It can be medications and we are forgotten to carry and we just buy it. No matter what price we pay, we just buy it. So that also becomes an example of uh, emergency product. Now next moving to shopping products. The shopping products can be of two types. They can be homogeneous and they can be heterogeneous. Now shopping product is usually something that is more expensive than your consumer products. And you will find it only in certain shops. So you really have to look for them and you have to go shop around for them. 
you have to make some sort of pre-purchase decisions or comparisons before you really go and look for them in the stores or in the shops. So as the name says homogeneous, it's basically shopping products that are basically similar. Like your um, consumers assume that um, homogeneous items would basically be dishwashers, tumble dryers, refrigerators and televisions. Okay, so when considering buying these homogeneous shopping products, consumers normally look for the lowest price brand that has the product feature that they want and they buy it largely because they do not see much difference between various competing brands. So these items that are named dishwashers or tumble dryers or refrigerators, we don't shop around for different brands and look at their range, colors, because they are all similar, they offer similar features, they are priced more or less the same. No two dish dishwashers will have major difference. Most of the time they are having common features, commonly priced. So we don't shop around, I mean we don't um, compare and contrast more. So those products are called as homogeneous products. So when we buy those products, we don't look for competing brands and what the other competing brand is offering, but we rather just decide on and buy it. So that is our homogeneous products. Now, heterogeneous product is contrast to him, homogeneous. Because what happens, consumers, they perceive heterogeneous shopping products are different. So it's basically, example is buying a furniture and buying a sports equipment. So there is no comparison between it. They are completely different. They form under different categories. They're priced differently. Their purpose of usage is completely different. So when they buy those kind of products, they look around, they browse for prices, for qualities, uh, features, what are the product attributes. So when these kind of extra effort is made when it comes to buying or making a decision for buying a product, those kind of shopping products are called as homogeneous shopping products. So the next one is specialty products. So when consumers are searching extensively for a particular item and are extremely reluctant to accept substitutes, now those items are called as speciality products. Now you just want exactly the same thing. You don't want any swap in that or you don't want anything. Even it's slightly different. You don't, um, you know, zero down on buying that product. So that becomes a speciality product. Normally, speciality products are rarely sought after products or they are very niche products where they are highly priced and they have their own existence in shopping malls or in certain shopping malls in a city or in the country. So owning your high priced cars or watches or um, going to gourmet restaurants to eat a certain item that you'll only find in those restaurants makes those products specialty products. So what happens, a buyer who is interested in buying a speciality product, he or she is willing to search around and find the desired brand of product that they are looking for. Okay, so that is an example of your speciality product. Um, also what happens um, when we're talking about speciality products, what makes the product special as well? It's mostly the marketeers of the company um, who own these um, highly priced items, they make it. Um, there is a brand, a wristwatch brand. Um, I don't know if you have come across that name. It's called Mikkel Herbaline. So the advertising of that brand itself or the watch, it has a punchline where it says masterpieces for the individual. So when you hear that punchline or you see that tagline, you will automatically understand it's a high end watch. Even the same happens in the banking sector. You will see um, net bank advertising for private banking service. They have a tagline that says, don't call us, we will call you, which means they are valuing you or they feel you are a valued customer or you are qualifying to have a private bank account with us. So you don't have to call us, we will call you. So that is what makes it a speciality product. 
Now, every time I'm using the word product doesn't restrict it to just product. It's also services as well. Then the last one is unsought products. Now, within unsought products, you have new unsought products or regularly unsought products. Now, products that is unknown to a buyer or a known product that the buyer does not actively buy is a unsought product. So either you don't know about the product or you rarely buy such kind of product. It makes a product as an unsought product. Now, there are two categories. The brand new products that do not have been in the market before at all, they fall under the new unsought product category until and unless there is advertising and there is distribution that is happening. Any product that comes to the market forms a new unsought products, which means such product was never existing before in the market. This is in for the first time. So people haven't heard or known about it. The regularly unsought products are products that we need, but we do not like to think about or want to spend money on those ones. Um, like you're buying fire extinguishers, buying funeral policies, buying tombstones, similar kind of products where you are aware that they exist, but you don't regularly buy them. That makes it a regularly unsought product. So that actually uh, brings down to the different kinds of consumer products that we have. Then we move on to product items, product lines and product mixes. Now products are categorized either lengthwise or widthwise. OK, so each of these have their own uniqueness. If it is a product item, which means it is just a specific product or a specific version of the product. If we are talking about a product line, then we are talking about closely related items. They may, may be slightly different from each other in terms of their composition, which is the variance of flavors, or it can be also in terms of different kind of um, colors or shapes or sizes. So they all form part of the product line. The next is product mix. Now product mix means all the products of the firm. So a particular company or organization or a firm, they can have different kinds of products that they offer, but they don't relate really well with each other. But all of them together form a product mix. OK, now the two other things is your length of the product line, which means the number of variants in the product line that you have. For example, a box of um, or a packet of dairy milk, but having with different flavors. You have your top deck, you have the ones with nuts. I think um, now they have new flavors added on too. So that makes the length of the product line. But the width of the product mix, you understand mix will be different products within the firm. So that makes the width, which means within that range, what all do you have to offer? And they don't necessarily have to be the same. Now, the next slide is the image, which will actually clarify you. What do I mean when I say product length or product width? I'll pause here for a minute. If there's any questions until here, we will discuss before I move on. Anybody who's got any questions? can either box or they can unmute and speak. Anyone who's got any questions? OK, I assume that you have understood until now. So we move on. So I'm not going to go too 
quick as well, seeing that it's our first session and you still are all absorbing while I'm speaking. So I'll see how far we can go and then I will stop it from there to finish it off in the next session. Even though it's not a lot, we'll see how the class feels. Okay, the next is branding. Now, anything that we're speaking about or we are discussing about, be it a product or a service, has a brand name attached to it. How does a product or how does a service gain its brand name? What does uh, or how does a product be called a brand? How do you think um, that happens? Anyone? Bongo, what do you think? How does how does a product um, get a brand name? Bongo, I'm talking to you. A mixle. Okay, then type it in the chat box if you think you are not able to speak. A mixle. Ilias, what do you mean purpose, Bongo? Is that all the answers that Google is giving you? Because I don't understand what you all are trying to say here. Okay, uniqueness. Yes, Suzipe, that's absolutely right. So a company or an organization has to have its own name and existence in the market in the target market that they are positioned. Remember last year when we studied segmentation, positioning. So when they are positioned in the target market, they should have had a name because of which companies know them. And that is the name that the product gets by falling under the category of that brand. So that's where a product or a service gets a brand name. Any product or service that is being born for the first time doesn't come with a predetermined brand name. They just get the name of the owner or the organization that they belong to. And that is merely due to the recognition, due to their past sales records, due to the performance of the brand. OK, so all of you that you are writing before that. I'm not sure if Google is giving you the right answers, but um, quite not close to what I meant to get from you. But thank you. So now a brand, it can be a name, it can be a term, it can be a symbol, it can be a logo, it can be a design, or it can be a combination of one or all of the above. Okay, that is actually um, competitively advantageous than their competitors' products, and they have some differentiation or some uniqueness to offer. So, Again, a brand name, it can be verbalized or it cannot be verbalized, which means you can either say it as a brand name or you cannot verbalize it if it is a sign or a logo or a symbol. Okay. Okay, sorry. 
the benefits of branding. Why do companies um, intend to brand a product? So obviously, branding gives some sort of product identification. The product gets its name. So the benefit will basically be your identification of the product. Also, repeat sales, which is due to the loyalty of the product or being loyal customer to the product and enhancing new product sales. So the most important purpose is product identification. So what happens is product identification also leads to benefits for marketeers. OK, so how? Because branding allows marketeers. Branding allows marketeers to distinguish their products from others, which also means that there is some sort of differentiation and that it makes shopping easier for buyers because now they already have a brand name which is being identified and approved by many people from the past sales and they don't have to use or waste time and effort in looking around more rather it's easy for them to go buy the product so it benefits the marketeers as well now if there is effective branding that is being done it also leads to preference of a brand over other brands so if you have correctly positioned your brand in the market, it will always be easier for consumers to prefer you as a brand of a company over other competitors' products. So which means you stand a better chance of having better sales and repeat sales than the other competitors in the market. You know, it's, um, it's like saying, um, where you have an example where there was a study that was done in the US where there were a group of children and they were given two chicken nugget boxes that were exactly the same in every respect except the fact that the one box had a McDonald's brand name on it and the other one was an unmarked one. So when they were asked to choose one of those, they just blindfoldedly chose McDonald's branded packaging rather than the one that came out of unmarked packaging. But what they didn't realize that both of them were from the same place. But just because this brand name in the box was there on top of it and identifying or visualizing that is so um, catchy, even for kids, they just, no matter how it tastes, they just say that this is the best because this is McDonald's. So that is what bad branding is and that is how effective branding is. It just also makes sure that companies who have done effective branding, they can charge a premium price of the product. So if they have been properly differentiated, they can also charge a higher price than a similar product say that is being sold by another company. OK, so for example, buying the same chicken nuggets from Spa um, under the Spa brand name, even though it tastes the same, even though it's healthy or even though it is more in quantity, it won't make the same feeling that then buying a box of four or six piece of chicken nuggets because this branding has been effectively done and they have positioned it in such a way that we are ready to pay that extra price for it, but we still want it, which is your McDonald's. So that is an example of effective branding or how product is identified. And that is one of the benefits of branding. Then also enhancing new product sales. So McDonald's, because they are known, no matter what new product line that they add, no matter what is their product mix, people will come and buy again and again, proving again and again that they are loyal customers. And that is ultimately going to enhance their sales, even if it is a new product. And then that is why we say there is benefit for customers as well. And then it branding ultimately has been well branded. It leads to high brand equity as well. Now the term brand equity refers to the monetary value of brand name. So brand equity is basically the value of the brand or that logo. We pay the price for a Nike or Adidas shoes is only because of the monetary value of that brand. Whereas you can buy another similar pair of tackies or footwear almost half the price from another brand which might not be as um, high in brand equity than these brands. So it's basically the money that you're paying for the brand name. 
so a brand that has high awareness a brand that has perceived quality and a brand that has loyalty among customers has high brand equity and some of these brands have good brand equity because of these factors and because of which we as consumers constantly buy them no matter what it entails and no matter what it is made of Then the next is features of effective brand names. What features do these brand names carry because of which they make themselves as effective brands? First of all, sorry, just a minute. Because I'm um, recording simultaneously, so I'm making sure that my um, recording is on for my cell phone as well. Okay, so because these brand names are easy to pronounce they're easy to recognize either if it's an image or a logo or a signage they're easy to remember the features of effective brand names are because they are easy to recognize they are short not longer names they are quite distinctive and unique in themselves they describe the product they describe the use of the product or what are the benefits that you're going to get from the product they have a positive connotation or it reinforces the desired product image or they are legally protectable be it nationally or internationally they are legally protected in both home and foreign markets and these are the features of effective brand names and because of which their survival and existence has been around for long periods of time and branding, it also helps uh, consumers to buy or identify products that they want to buy again and again and to avoid the ones that they do not. So brand loyalty that we were talking about, it's also a constant or consistent preference for one brand over all the others in the same product category. So you will see most of the time, half the users in the product categories like your toothpaste and coffees and your soap and sauces you will see they're loyal to one particular brand most of the time it's not because they like it or not because um, they understand what goes into that product but because they have been buying it for years and months they just decide on carrying it further as well and that's what is brand loyalty so you don't necessarily have to like the product all the time or just um, appreciate the features that goes into it or it's making a benefit to you but because you have been doing it all these years, you just prefer to carry on. How often do we change our toothpaste? Or how often do we change the coffee that we drink? We don't. We just keep on doing it for months because we are so used to. So that makes us brand loyal to a particular brand for the product that we buy from them. Okay. So moving on to branding decisions. What are the major branding decisions that we need to make? I'm going to pause here for a minute um, if there are any questions before I move on. And also at the same time, we have some around seven, eight slides to go. So is the class okay for me to finish it or you want it um, to be carried on in the next session? Anyone? Are you okay if I carry it further and we finish the chapter? Okay, that's fine. We can do that. Okay. Okay. So in the next section on major branding decisions, a brand is either a brand or it is a no brand. Now a no brand product is basically a, a generic product that is a no brand product that has no brand name 
it is um, low cost and it is simply identified by its product category so you will see your no name brands in pick and pay has its own Discom will have its own clicks will have its own so all those shop price got its own checkers has its own so any such no name brands which has no frills or no um, packaging or extra add-ons that has been added to it they don't carry a brand name they fall under one umbrella brand name which is basically the name of the retailer or the name of the manufacturer and that's why they are no brand products then the other category is your branded products so obviously anything that has been having a private label or a private brand name and has been having significant market shares in some of their categories so they will be a brand in themselves so they can either be a manufacturer brand or it can be a private brand now in manufacturers brand we have individual family and combination brand and in private brand we have individual and family brand now first to understand a manufacturers brand so the brand name of a manufacturer is a manufacturers brand like your Samsung and Sony are manufacturers brand because that is a national brand and that is how they have been named. So a manufacturer's brand is more precisely defines the brand's owner himself, okay, which is either Sony or Samsung. And a private brand, sometimes also referred to as a store brand, is a brand name that is owned either by a wholesaler or a retailer, which is basically your Woolworths, Pick and Pay, ShopRite, Checkers. They are all private brands. Now, if you understand the key advantages of having a manufacturer's brand is a manufacturer brand needs to carry on heavy advertising to the consumers. So another manufacturer brand is Unilever. Why? Because within their umbrella brand, there's so many sub brands. They have to strongly advertise their brands in order to exist in the market. So some well-known manufacturer's brand is also your Fisher Price. Five Roses, um, I think your Mr. Balls Chutney. So all of those are your examples of manufacturers brands. And by being a manufacturer brand, they also offer quick delivery because there is no middleman involved and there is no inventory. There is um, a lot of cost saving. There is no in between dealer or wholesaler. So it's always quicker in terms of delivery. And then in manufacturer's brand also, if a dealer happens to sell a manufacturer's brand of poor quality or of uh, not up to the standards, then the customers simply switch brands, but they remain loyal to the dealer. Sometimes it happens because they are mostly, mostly manufactured products. And at times you might just receive a product which is not of the standard mark, um, of the standard value or standard, uh, measures that they should have then coming to private brands the key advantage of carrying a private brand is a wholesaler or a retailer can usually have higher profits on its own brand because they have set a markup price which is normally four times the cost price of the product and because of which they become very exclusive because they are private brands so there is less pressure on them to uh, put the products on markdowns or on sale. Now, a private brand actually always tries to tie the customer to the retailer. So you will see those private label brands where they try attracting the customers either by packaging or either by adding product lines or either by making themselves unique than the manufacturer's brand. Now, coming to individual and family brands. So many companies, they have different brand names for different products. Now that is called as individual branding. So most companies, they use individual brands when they feel their product is varying considerably, not just in usage, but also in terms of quality and in terms of performance. Now an example for that would be, for instance, it. Um, if you're wearing or if you are trying to use the same brand name for a pair of socks as well as a cricket bat 
So that's an example where um, we speak about individual branding. You would see Unilever as a brand. They target segments of the soap market with different brand names. They are still an individual brand in themselves. Like you have your Dove, you have Lux, you have Breeze, you have Sunlight. Now they are examples of individual brands. Even though they fall under the manufacturer's brand by the name Unilever, but they have their own individual brand names, which is the brand name of the product in itself. But on the other hand, there will be firms that market several different products under the same brand name, which is your family brand, like Sony. Under the same brand of Sony, you will find there are radios, televisions, there are stereos, and any other electronic products. So they form under family brand. And combination is where you will see that there is a mix of family brand names and individual brands, and that's what they form as a combination brand. So certain brands, they hold together the family brand and individual brand. Now the next in private brand, we have individual brand and family brand, and that's exactly similar to the manufacturer's individual and family brand as well. So obviously when it's individual, private brands have their own individual brands within their categories, and they also have their family brand under their private brands. Is it clear until now, any questions? So this is what I have been speaking about. There is no brands and then we have manufacturers, private, individual and family brands. Then we come to something that I assume you would have heard before is trademark. Now trademark basically is an exclusive right to use either a brand or a part of a brand or a symbol. That is your trademark. Now, certain parts of a brand that normally qualifies for a trademark protection, it can be either in the form of a shape, it can be a color or design, it can be phrases, you know, brand names have their own catchy phrases or short forms that we call as abbreviations. So it's a trademark in general is a, is a legal thing. It is primarily used by the legal community and it has been um, statuated by law. It has been um, interpreted by the judiciary, which means you cannot really um, change all of a sudden anything suddenly because it is trademark as such as static. And um, the law also doesn't allow you to violate it or any other outsider also cannot violate it as such. So a brand is more or less like a broader form, but trademark is something which is very exclusive. So you cannot have a brand name as trademarked, but maybe the symbol of the brand name or maybe the shape of um, the Nike Sush logo, for example, it can be trademarked. So something that is quite exclusive. So these are the legal implications of branding. Now one can register a trademark and that can be registered for a period of 10 years, but it also can be renewed from time to time. There is something called as the Trademark Act um, that allows you to trademark your exclusivity of your brand name. And also if your trademark is not registered, those unregistered trademarks can also be defended in terms of common law. So the registration procedure will result in providing you a registration certificate that has sort of a legal status and it is allowing the owner of the registered trademark the exclusive right to use that mark so that nobody else can copy that mark and use it within their brand name. Okay. Now the generic product name is basically identifying a product by class or type and something that cannot be trademarked, something that is very generic. You cannot really trademark it. So, and the reason because it is um, 
something that is widely used and you cannot generic because uh, you cannot uh, trademark it because it's not exclusive. It is very commonly used across. So you will see there will be brand names that were not protected enough, keeping these factors in mind, and they will have to run to court or be part of uh, the law in terms of um, suing someone or somebody else suing them, saying that they have used this or infringed the law and um, that they have not followed the trademark criteria that the other company has already applied and all of that. But firms that have stronger brand presence and um, are premium brands like your Xerox or Levi's or McDonald's or Rolls Royce, they enforce their trademarks and make sure that their trademark is not just visible in their company or within their company, but also wherever they are advertised or wherever they are marketed so that no one considers them as generic and that there is no such um, threatenment of lawsuits against comp uh, uh, competitors that they are violating the trademarks. Okay. Moving on. The next part is um, copyright. Now, what is copyright? It is, you will see there is a slight difference between copyright and trademark. Now, copyright is basically an exclusive, um, exclusive legal right. You know, in trademark, we said it has an exclusive right over a design or a color or a logo. Sorry, whereas copyright is basically an exclusive legal right to reproduce or to publish or to sell the matter in the form of literacy or music or artwork where you are giving the copyright to someone to make copies out of it. You will see in many books or in textbooks also they say that um, you don't have any right to make copies of it. They have copyright issues and there is a small symbol of C and a circle around it. So you will see it says the copyright of this book that you are reading is wasted by the publisher. So which means you are not allowed to copy without the permission of the publisher because you are violating the copyright laws. So that is copyright when you are sort of duplicating. But trademark where we spoke about something that you want to make it very exclusive to yourself as part of your brand, not the whole brand, but a part of your brand. Now that is up to the company to decide what part of the brand they are willing to trademark. Next, we speak about packaging. We just have one or two slides away, so almost done. Packaging is always a very uh, practical aspect. It's um, not just about the look. It's not just about the design of the packaging, but it's also about holding the contents together that is inside the packaging. It is also about protecting the goods. It is also about uh, moving through the proper channel of distribution. But nowadays, packaging has also come up with a competitive advantage. Through packaging, companies try to establish a competitive advantage, not just by the look of it, but the design of the packaging. The images or the logos or the content the ingredients, everything that you want to know about the product, everything is on the packaging. So companies are making sure that they also cash in in the form of packaging that they are doing to sell their products. Okay, now the packaging has three most important functions. Now they are to contain and pro protect products, to promote products, so that can also act as a promotion, and to ensure that you are facilitating storage, you are facilitating use and convenience of the product. And then the last function of packaging is to make sure that packaging with becoming increasingly important, it is also vital to facilitate recycling and reducing environmental damage. So it's to do with sustainable packaging as well. So these are the major functions in packaging. If you see, it's not just about storage, it's not just about protection, but it's also about advertisement, promotion, and sustainability as well. Then moving on to labeling. So when we're speaking about packaging and promoting products, 
there is something that is called as labeling. Whenever you buy any item on the package, you will see there is a label which is sort of coded. And under those codes, you will see there are numbers that have been written. So labeling generally takes one or two forms. The one is persuasive labeling and the other is informational labeling. Persuasive labeling where it focuses on a promotional theme or on the basis of the logo and consumer information, which is secondary, <coughs> which is your first page of the labeling or the front of the packaging that you see. Like, um, for example, you will see um, in food items, like in certain sauces, making use of persuasive labels um, with the idea of strengthening the brand identity. They will say new, improved, or um, super strong or super hot sauce something that is very persuasive that makes it interesting for consumers to buy or to create some sort of newness to the product that is called as persuasive labeling informational labeling is designed to help consumers make specific product selections now it was as i said informational it is about the content what are the few features of the content how do you take care? How do you use that product? What is the nutritional information about the product? So that all is provided in the form of informational labeling. You will see direction and users. You will see what it is made of, how many times you can use, or how do you use, and what time you use. All of these form part of your informational labeling. And then the last is the universal product code. Now, universal product code, or as it's called UPC, you see that it appears on many items in supermarkets and in other high volume outlets. It has been around for close to 50 years now. And this numerical code, the way it appears with a series of thick and thin vertical lines that you see, they are called as barcodes. Now, these lines are read by computerized scanners. So you will see the lady at the till, they will just read the barcode or scan the barcode. So it is computerized and it matches the code with their brand name, with their packaging size and with their price. And they also print information on the cash register tapes. You will see that helps retailers to rapidly and also accurately prepare records of customer purchases. And it also helps them to understand and control inventories and also to track sales. So there is also in South Africa, we have a South African numbering association that administers the allocation of UPCs in South Africa. So most retailers today, they refuse to accept the products that do not carry a UPC because then they are not well informed about where the product is coming from and where is it going. So you can see from the code, the one side it says number system, the first zero then the next five digits is about the manufacturing code which means where it was manufactured and what was the style number and what was the numbering of that product then the next one is about product code so there will be different product lines or different product mix coming from an um, firm or uh, organization so this gives idea about the product code and then the last one is check digit which is very unique to the retailer And then the last part is product warranties. Now, as a package is designed to protect the product, a warranty protects the buyer and it gives essential information about the product. So a warranty sort of confirms the quality or the performance of a product or a service. And normally a warranty is basically a written guarantee. So it um, is called as an expressed warranty. Now, expressed warranty it ranges from simple statements such as 100% cotton is a guarantee of quality. Okay, so they will say 100% cotton, or it will say complete satisfaction guarantee. So that means it is an expressed warranty. By contrast, an implied warranty is basically an unwritten guarantee that the item or service is fit for the purpose for it was for which it was sold but it doesn't say anything else so it says it's just fit it might not be perfect it might be just fit so there is a slight glitch there 
So for example, if there is a camera manufacturer that says that um, their product carries a one year warranty against manufacturing defects. So if anything goes wrong with your product, be it the light or be it the charger or any other item in that range, and the fault is due to manufacturing error, then the company is not going, uh, will probably repair or replace the item free of charge. But if it is not, then they're not going to do anything about it. It is probably due to your manhandling that has resulted in something like this. So that's why they are very clear and they're very specific what they write because um, consumers can go back and consumers can sue them and say, okay, this is what it is and I'm not happy with it and it looks like a manufacturing product. Therefore, they very cleverly highlight it and say, if it is a manufacturing error, we are going to replace or we are going to uh, fix it free of charge, but if it's not, so we are not going to do anything about it. So that finishes the chapter, and um, I'm going to just stop sharing the slide. And if there are any questions, you can just unmute yourself or you can just type it in the chat box. Are there any questions from anyone in the class or is there any part of the section of the chapter that you want me to go through again or anything that you didn't understand? Okay, if there isn't anything, then um, I'm going to stop recording the session.